Okay. I might need to share screen in the Teams window as well. Okay. Sorry. Gain a new appreciation for <laughs> what Brandon does. Say so screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. I've uh, got through the uh, slight uh, technical issues at the start there. Um, there is a handout if anyone would like one. Uh, I promise it's not too long or too intimidating and it's entirely in English, um, which isn't always the case. Um, thank you for the introduction. As, um, as Kevin hinted out there, this is a talk that's based on a project that I've been working on for a while, and in fact, uh, on a book manuscript that was submitted last month, um, that I've been working on on and off for about the last three years. Uh, it's obviously difficult to try and compress 120,000 words of book into about 50 minutes of talk. Um, and the options are either talk incredibly fast uh, or try and draw out some pertinent themes. Uh, and so I've chosen to do the latter. Um, I'll explain a bit about the project and explain a bit about the poem that I'm going to be looking at um, over the course of today and in the course of the book in a second. But I want to start with a couple of passages from that poem um, to give you some sense of what it's like um, as a piece of literature, um, but also to draw out some of the implications that we might have in thinking about this as a historical text. So thinking about this as a work of literature, but also as a text that had a function in the society in which it was produced. The text I'm talking about is a poem called the Johannes, an epic poem called the Johannes by a writer called Charippus. Um, and this is a scene where the hero, the epic hero of that poem, uh, an individual called John Troglita, um, the name Johannes means basically the poem of the John, sounds like really like that, um, but it's a poem about his heroic deeds. This is his first glimpse of North Africa. He's an Eastern Roman general um, who's coming with his fleet from Constantinople to North Africa. And this is the first um, view of that territory that he sees. At last, the commander looked out at the burning shore and recognised there the hand of untamable Mars. Nor was there any doubt, for the flames bore witness to the truth. The winds raised spirals of flame that curled at their peaks, and the ashes mixed with smoke flying beyond the stars scattered tiny sparks into the highest heavens. Now the fire surged into the middle of the sky, engulfing everything in the burning land. The ripe crops burned in the fields, and every tree strengthened the fire that fed on its branches until they crumbled, consumed into ashes. The wretched cities fell as their citizens were slaughtered and with their roofs swept away, the walls were engulfed in flames. This is a pretty grim portrait of a land at war. And it's interesting, I think, because of the different resonances that this particular passage would have had for the different audiences at the time of the first performance of the poem. So the events here are set in the late summer of 546. The poem itself was written very quickly after the campaigns that John fought. He fought in campaigns that lasted just three years, 546, 47, and 48. The poem was written in a hurry and was eventually performed in around about 550 or 551 in Carthage as part of the triumphal celebrations that marked the victory, marked John's final victory. And different people, I think, would have heard different things or had different associations um, from this set of images. John himself, who is a historical figure, would have thought back to this moment when he was looking out from the fleets at the burning cities, and from there would have thought still further back to his first glimpse, the glimpse of the North African landscape about 13 years earlier, when he had arrived as part of the great conquering fleet, the Eastern Roman fleet that arrived under the general Belisarius, uh, following the guidance of the uh, Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian. Um, who launched an invasion of North Africa in late summer 533. Uh, John was a relatively junior officer at that time. The fleet, um, which consisted, we're told, uh, or, or the, the expeditionary army involved, we're told, 18,000 men, uh, arrived here at Caput Varda um, on the coast of Byzacium and extremely quickly made their way to Carthage. And within two or three weeks, Carthage had been captured by the imperial forces, to the extent that Belisarius supposedly feasted um, on the meal that had been prepared for the Feast of St. Cyprian um, in honour of the Vandal King Gelema. So the Vandals had previously held North Africa and the Byzantines knocked them out within around about two weeks. By spring the following year, spring 5, 
1534, Gelimer himself had been captured and was brought to Constantinople. Belisarius brought him to Constantinople and a triumph was celebrated on the sands of the Hippodrome of the Eastern capital. The first such triumph to have been celebrated, according to the Byzantine historian Procopius, for 500 years. That's not true, but it was nevertheless a really significant historical event. And this was remembered within Constantinople as being a major triumph for Justinian at a time when his reign was in a slightly shaky position. Um, the triumph itself um, would have looked something like this. Uh, this is actually a relief of a triumph from the first century from the uh, Arch of Titus in Rome. But some of the plunder that's uh, celebrated here, including the seven um, armed candlestick, the menorah, which was taken from the Temple of Jerusalem in 70 by the Roman troops, had been captured by the Vandals when they sacked Rome in 455 and was taken again by the Byzantines when they captured Carthage in 533 and was brought in triumph to Constantinople. Um, so it's this sort of form of celebration that would have taken place there at that time. And the next 10 years or so, from the point of view of the imperial court, was a time of relative peace and prosperity within North Africa. Um, it was a time of substantial rebuilding across the territories, uh, including the fortification of a number of cities in about 530 or five, uh, 539 uh, or 540, um, and the establishment uh, and the fortification of some uh, old uh, existing Roman structures, um, as we see here from Hydra uh, or Amidara in, uh, in central Numidia. Um, thereafter, North Africa remained broadly um, imperial uh, until the 7th century, until the conquest, the Isla Islamic conquest of the 7th century. Uh, and just to clarify, when I'm talking about North Africa here, uh, I am talking about more or less this part um, of the sort of eastern Maghreb, basically what's now Tunisia and northeastern Algeria, um, and also some parts of uh, coastal Libya, who kind of, which kind of falls off the map here. So to a degree, when John Troglita thought back on his first glimpse of Africa, or his second glimpse of Africa, he would have thought back to this, uh, this moment of triumph. For other people listening to the, that particular passage, that particular evocation of the African landscape, there would have been inescapable echoes of another great work of Latin literature or a great work of Latin literature, which is to say Virgil's Aeneas, the foundational Latin epic, really, um, which was a poem that also starts with a hero coming from the Eastern Mediterranean and finding himself washed up on the North African shore, um, which is indeed something that's echoed directly within the Johannes. Equally, the particular image of a hero standing on the deck of a ship, looking at the burning city of Carthage, or flames creeping up to the sky from the city of Carthage, um, was a direct evocation um, of a sequence that we see at the end of book four of the Aeneid and the start of book five, uh, when Aeneid is leaving North Africa, heading for Italy, and leaving behind him um, the bereft Dido, who has killed herself in a funeral pyre, um, is then burnt, and uh, Aeneas sees this as he sort of disappears over the horizon. Um, it would, it would have been extremely clear to anyone hearing this poem for the first time, anyone who was educated enough to understand Latin poetry in the first place, um, would have been thoroughly educated within Virgil. It would have been clear that what Caripus is doing here is retelling the story, the very recent campaigns of John Trogneta in the language and in the idiom of classical Roman epic. And John never hides this. One of the, uh, the second passage uh, on the handout um, comes from the preface and is uh, a clear indication of his debts. Uh, the bard of Smyrna, that's Homer, described strong Achilles as the master Virgil did Aeneas. John's achievement inspired me to describe his battles and preserve his deeds for those yet to come. But while John surpasses Aeneas in valour, my song is unworthy of Virgil. And this Virgilian theme permeates the epic as a whole. It's hard to escape Virgil um, as you're reading this epic. The third response which I want to think about is some of these inhabitants of Carthage uh, in 551 thinking about this image of their homeland on fire just five years before. Um, and we really have to emphasize precisely the, the, the sort of narrowness of the historical scope that we're talking about here. Five years before that, and um, that's roughly uh, or the uh, Brexit referendum, Donald Trump's election, and Leicester City winning the uh, premiership happened longer ago than five years ago. This is very, very recent history um, for people living at the time. Uh, and in fact, for them, they'd have looked back at 546, not necessarily as being um, the kind of first moment of the triumphant reconquest, uh, not necessarily as being just a literary conceit, a way of playing around with Virgilian language, but rather a memory of the genuine tragedy that they had been suffering over at least a decade or so uh, of quite stark 
uh, mutiny, civil war, and plague. Uh, I said earlier that one of the things that, uh, that Justinian and people in the imperial capital were relatively confident to talk about um, the conquest of Africa as being wholly successful as they moved on to other campaigns in Italy and Spain. But within North Africa, things were much less straightforward. And there were periods of bad harvest, and the area was struck by a plague, as was everywhere in 542 and 543, uh, and there was a succession of military mutinies um, and invasions uh, so-called invasions by neighbouring Moorish peoples, um, which caused genuine suffering across the whole of this region. In this sense, for some people who are listening to this poem, they're not just listening to a literary work, they're listening to an immediate work of, their, of, of kind of local history. And these three different resonances, uh, the triumphal idea, the literary idea, and the idea of local history uh, and, and kind of shared memory, um, are themes that I'd like to kind of explore in a bit of detail. The second passage which I want to look at is very, very different in tone and style um, and comes from book five of the, uh, of the Johannes. Um, and again, John is our focus here, but in this case, we're not looking with him, we're looking at him and we're looking at him uh, as he makes his way uh, viciously through the battlefield. I won't roll, uh, read the whole thing out here. Um, this is intended as a kind of general illustration of the kind of stuff that we see. Um, so picking it up halfway through, um, cutting through the helmet and cloak, he severed brow, eyes and his long hair altogether. He took out the quick horse of uh, Guasutia with a spear thrown in close combat. The spear trembled in its left flank and penetrating both the horse's entrails and its master's right foot with its hot iron, it hung there hooked. The wounded horse collapsed crushing its master in its fall and killing him with a deadly weight. Unstoppable now, he, that's John, split Manzarassan in two with his unyielding sword, and the body parted to either side, falling in two halves. He sliced the neck of Iartus and the hand that bore his weapon. It still held the sword as his body fell cold to the ground. There is loads of this in the poem. About 20% of the poem as a whole is made up of battle sequences like this, heavily stylized battle sequences, that clearly can bear no relation whatsoever to the actual battles that were being fought at the time. John Trogdita himself, for example, is credited with 47 named victims over the course of the poem, as well as two horses and a camel. Um, this is impossible for a Byzantine general, and most of his uh, immediate entourage have similar kind of sequences of uh, slayings and killings like this. This is also really standard in classical epic. Homer does this a lot, and Virgil does this a lot, Charybdis does this to an unusual extent, and the juxtaposition between his kind of more historical moments, so his description of John, John's landing, or campaign movements throughout North Africa as a campaign goes on, with these extraordinary sequences, uh, have an effect that's a bit like watching a documentary on the Vietnam War and having it interspersed with moments from John Wick every so often, where you kind of come across them and go, whoa, cool, but weird. How does that work? Uh, and in fact, the John Wick analogy works quite well, in the sense that if you watch that film, there is nothing that is original about that film apart from its style. It does what it does. It's got the ingredients and it puts them together in a really interesting choreography. That's what Charyphus does and that's what earlier ethicists had done as well. This is one of the ways in which they could show off. Um, so two different passages there to start thinking about and I'll come back to um, how, they, how they sort of fit together a bit a bit later on. But it's time, I think, to introduce the poem a bit more clearly um, to explain what it is precisely that we're talking about here um, and why I wanted to study it in the first place uh, and also the way in which it's been approached in the past. So the first thing to say is it's an epic um, which is a poem written in Latin hexameters, it's written in Latin um, and it consists of eight books, um, a total of about 4,900 lines and that's about half the length of Virgil's Aeneas but it's still a relatively substantial epic, it's an extremely long epic by the standards of late antiquity, the period when it was written, um, as we'll see. Um, as a point of reference, uh, there is a standard English prose translation. The, the translations on the handout are mine, but the standard English prose translation is about 140 pages long, which gives you some indication of the kind of length that we're talking about here, if you don't instinctively think in Latin hexameter lines. Um, it was written, as I said, in about 551 to commemorate the victories of John Troglita between 546 and 548. Um, nominally over Moorish groups, consistently termed the Maori or the Marusi, uh, Marusii um, within the poem, uh, over Byzacium and Tripolitania. So those are the areas basically to the south of um, Carthage in what's now central and southern Tunisia um, and the northern coast of Libya. 
Um, it's stressed in the uh, proem, in the opening, in the preface um, to the nobles of Carthage um, within the context of kind of triumphant success. This is marking the successful end of the campaign. And there are various kind of suggestions, looks forward um, to the inevitable successful conclusion of the campaign as, as the poem goes on. Uh, and it is explicitly and directly modelled on the Aeneid, as we've already seen, and as we'll come back to once or twice. Ostensibly, then, it is clearly a celebration of Byzantine military success. John is undoubtedly the hero. He's quite a boring hero in spite of his spectacular killing streaks. Um, but nevertheless, it's about him and it's about his military victories. It's interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, one is it's often identified as the last cla classical epic of antiquity. And in fact, it's a bit of an outlier. Um, as I said before, Virgil's Aeneid is basically the kind of defining work of Latin epic. There are a couple of works that come before it, uh, and there are a handful that come after it, but the Aeneid is undoubtedly the most important and influential work in the Latin epic tradition. Uh, after Virgil, there's a handful of later epicists, Ovid's most famously, but then a couple of other writers like Lucan and Silius Italicus. But the trend of writing historical epic of this form falls out of fashion in the second century. Um, so Charippus writing one in the middle of the sixth um, is extremely unusual. Another thing that's quite unusual about Charippus is the way in which his text survives. Now, the vast majority of Latin texts from classical antiquity, the overwhelming majority of classical texts from uh, Latin antiquity, survive to us in later medieval copies, especially manuscripts of the 8th and 9th century. There's very, very little that survives from before the 8th century, but there's a large uh, sort of swell of manuscripts that survive from that time, and they're all written down during the Carolingian Renaissance. Um, the most popular texts, we have hundreds of different manuscripts. So we have hundreds of different manuscripts of the Aeneid, which later editors can kind of piece together, identify families of manuscripts, and figure out from the relations between these families uh, something like what the original text might have looked like or the original versions might have looked like. Um, and there's a lot of that over the course of the 19th and 20th century. That's standard practice for classical texts. Charippus' Johannes survives in one manuscript of the 14th century, um, and it was copied by, a Latin, uh, by an Italian poet um, who doesn't seem to have had brilliant Latin. Um, the net result of that is that the text we have is horrible. There are some gaps in it, um, and a lot of the Latin is quite confused. Um, it's not completely clear whether this confusion is the later poets, a guy called De Boni, uh, or Charippus himself. Um, and there are lots of areas where, where there can be correction. The, the net result of this is editorialising is quite easy. There are lots and lots of different manuscripts to try and figure out the original form. Um, but actually figuring out the original form of the text is nevertheless really difficult because the Latin is so bad. As a result of that, there has been way more classical scholarship on this poem than you would expect because it's just a really in interesting puzzle for people who are really good at Latin uh, and want to laugh and be patronising about a sixth century poet who probably wasn't quite as good at that. Um, it's also really important because it's a vital historical source for the events that it describes. We're lucky in having a Greek historian called Procopius who describes events um, in the early part of the Byzantine conquest of North Africa, including the conquest itself, right up to 546, and then he sort of loses interest. Um, from 546 to 548, uh, Charippus provides us with a really, with a, a kind of the next chapter um, within that story. That's not very much history, obviously, two or three years, but he's also really important on the groups who John was fighting, these different Moorish groups. He includes within the text at least 34 or 35 different names of Moorish groups. He gives some hints at things like their religious practices, their social organisation, their political organisation, and so on, with the result that Charippus is arguably the single most important text that survives that we have on Moorish North Africa in this period. So that's no small thing. Um, and it's also kind of an interesting text, thinking about how um, Africa, North Africans themselves thought about their position um, within the Eastern Empire. This is more or less the structure um, that the book takes, just to kind of situate yourself a bit. Um, in book one, as we've seen, John gets appointed, um, he sails to North Africa, he lands uh, and he embarks on the opening of his campaign. Um, we get some early skirmishes in book two. Um, much of book three and book four is taken up with a flashback in the voice of a Roman officer called Liberatus, who describes to John how the war started, how we got here, basically, um, why everything went down the toilet. Um, and then we have an order of battle. And then we have the first battle in book five. And there's a passage from book five that we looked at um, with John on one of his killing sprees. All of this takes place basically in the late summer and early autumn of 546. 
Um, book six is the next campaigning season, which goes less well for John. He has a single campaign uh, where he goes to the south, basically the border of Tunisia and Libya, and is defeated there. Um, and then there's a regrouping. And then in book seven and eight, there's a climactic victory in the last uh, season of campaigning in 548, a victory at a place called um, Campi Catonis, the fields of Cato. Um, that's just a kind of rough order and organization of how this works. Now, Caribus's poem has been relatively well studied, um, especially by philologists or classicists, as I've said, um, and also by historians who are interested in Byzantine Africa to a degree, and especially Moorish North Africa. And I came to this text primarily because I was interested in the Moors. Um, I wanted to know precisely how that social organization worked of these groups who were the successors to the Roman state in North Africa, who had never been studied in any detail at all, in spite of the fact that the archeology span that they left behind was quite considerable. There are loads of really interesting inscriptions, and there's this bloody great epic poem about them. Um, I was interested in kind of piecing this together um, into a history. And I wasn't particularly unusual in doing that. But as I kind of looked into it in more detail and started to embark on the, the project itself, the book itself, I became increasingly interested in precisely why it was that this guy had written an epic at all. What was the purpose of celebrating a largely forgotten campaign, campaign or a largely uninteresting campaign? It wasn't forgotten at the time, obviously, it was writing immediately afterwards, but a largely uninteresting campaign in this spectacularly grandiose language. Now, the standard interpretation of this um, is encapsulated quite well by a scholar called Averill Cameron, who is a tremendously important scholar um, and brilliant scholar um, in, uh, in Oxford, who's also one of the few Anglophone writers to engage at length with the, with the text at all. Um, and in some ways, her interpretations in a couple of articles in the early 1980s basically served as the definitive explanation for what was going on here. She argued that what Charippus is doing is he's writing an epic in order to celebrate Byzantine power, imperial power, at a time when it was particularly difficult um, within the imperial state because of some theological uh, debates that were going on at the time, something called the th Three Chapters Controversy, um, which was caused by Justinian having his sense uh, of precisely which uh, church fathers should be included in the sort of orthodox canon of acceptable theology, uh, and the churches in his new Western provinces disagreeing with him about that. Um, this caused enormous crisis at the time, and Cameron argued that basically the Johannes is intended to distract from that and to basically say, oh, let's talk about how great um, wars are. And she argued on the strength of that, that basically what Charippus does in this poem is just always present the Byzantine presence in as positive a view as possible. Um, there's a quote from Cameron uh, as passage five on the handout, and, and this, this is typical of her argument, it's not misrepresenting her. Um, in all of this, Charippus not only bears out the general bias of the narrative of Procopius, but tailors the story even more to the Byzantine side. He was consciously writing not only to please the Byzantine rulers, but to persuade the local population of the Byzantine case at a time when such persuasion was urgently needed, not only to justify the military situation, but to assist the reception of Justinian's unpopular attempt to enforce Eastern Orthodoxy. And everyone has always assumed that. They've gone, oh, well, we've got Charippus. He's biased because he's basically celebrating the uh, imperial presence. Uh, and let's move on and dig into the details. But there are some problems with that interpretation. Um, firstly, if you want to praise rulers at this in this period, there is a very well-developed genre of writing called panegyric, which does exactly that. And there are loads of panegyrics which survive from antiquity, especially late antiquity. If you really want to write an epic, there's even a kind of subgenre, although the existence of this is a bit debated, called epic panegyric, where you have some epic elements, but it's basically a panegyric and it's quite short. Um, Charippus doesn't do that. Charippus writes a massive historical epic that is way longer. It's four or five times longer than the longest panegyric epic. And nobody's really tried to do this for 400 years. That in itself is relatively unusual. And equally important, I think more important than that, there are loads of elements within the Johannes, when you look at it closely, that are way less celebratory of Byzantine imperial power than this original reading would suggest. We've already seen that we've got John Troglita turning up and seeing the coast of uh, Byzantine Africa in flames and everybody being incredibly miserable. And there are various other passages that illustrate the point as well. Uh, passage three on the handout, the noble and poor were all overcome by the same fate. Tears echoed everywhere, anguish, terror ran through all and everything was shaken with dreadful dangers. Talks about lamentations and sorrows and loss. And even if we see this as the Cameron argument has it as being the starting point, this is the low point and John Troglita builds up from that. 
It doesn't say very much about the Justinianic Empire in North Africa um, if everybody is in this state of lamentation. Uh, and this also doesn't really explain these massive killing sprees that take up such a large amount of the poem. Thinking about this or kind of dealing with this made me think a bit more about the precise context that we're talking about. So going back to those circumstances in the summer of 546, precisely where this conflict came from and precisely how this was experienced by the various different participants um, in this drama. Uh, and as soon as you think about that, then all of a sudden the poem takes on a slightly different hue. Uh, and here we're helped substantially by uh, material within the Johannes itself, but also by that corroborative account that we have from Procopius, who describes quite a lot of this um, in some detail. According to Charippus, and thanks to his uh, narrative, according to quite a lot of modern historical accounts of this period, it's a pretty straightforward conflict. Um, basically, we've got a bunch of hostile Moorish barbarians under a leader called Antalas, um, who allies with another group of barbarians um, called the Laguartan. The precise nature of the Laguartan confederacy um, is, or kind of alliance is, is uncertain, um, but they come from Tripolitania or Sirtica, so basically the southern side of the Sirtic Gulf. Um, they come together in northern By uh, Byzacium uh, and John fights against them um, with uh, the help of allied Moors uh, from a similar sort of region to Antalas uh, under the leadership of an individual called Cusina. Um, and the Roman garrison all come on side with John. They all fight alongside Cusina. They defeat Antalas uh, in 546 and then defeat Antalas and the Laguartan together in 548. Job done. This is all pretty straightforward. It's black and white. We know who wins. In fact, Things are inevitably a bit more complicated than that. This now gets a little bit finickety. Um, this was the point at which I was repeatedly slamming my head against the desk um, in various different libraries as I was researching this. So I will explain this to you as clearly as I can, uh, and hopefully it will more or less make sense. Um, but what I want to do now is to explain basically how the Byzantine administration worked and who was occupying the key roles a year before, so in 545. Uh, and we know about this from Copius and also lots of laws. Happily, there are a couple of laws that survive issued in 534 that determine exactly how the administration is to be run. So we can, quite, we can be quite confident about the details here. Now, the most important thing, the, the civil administration of North Africa was under a Praetorian prefect. Uh, and in 545, this is an individual called Athanasius, an elderly but quite well-respected man called Athanasius, who had served elsewhere in the empire as well. Uh, he was based in Carthage uh, and he was assisted um, by provincial governors uh, in Zugatania or Africa proper, that's the province around here, around Carthage, in Byzacium, which is the area down here, uh, in Numidia, which is the area here, in Mauritania, which is the area around Const uh, Constantina, um, and then um, in Tripolitania down here as well. The military side of things was basically split between regional commanders. These are easily the most important military figures within North Africa, um, and they are assigned by province as well. There are five altogether, but the two most important are those stations in Numidia. Um, there's an individual called Dux Numidia, and I really like the title Dux, which basically means Duke, but it sounds like a classic Leicester greeting. Uh, Dux Numidia, the Duke of uh, Numidia, Gunthrith, uh, and the Dux by Zakenai, uh, who's an individual called Marcentius. Uh, as I said before, there's, there's also a Dux Tripolitani uh, and a Dux Mauritani, but we don't have to worry about them. Um, each of them has a field army and they also have a number of kind of frontier troops under their control. The exact numbers of troops are not completely clear, um, but I reckon we're probably looking at somewhere between three and 5,000 troops each. So the numbers are relatively small, uh, but they're not completely insignificant. Nominally in charge of the Byzantine military presence in North Africa um, is the Magister Militum. And Magister Militum basically just means general. It's a title that is used a lot in a variety of different ways. And it seems likely that this wasn't a formal position. It was always an extraordinary position for the first 40 years or so of the Byzantine presence. Um, so these individuals basically had this post, post and they were told, OK, it's a bit of an emergency. You can kind of look after things. But the others weren't formally subordinate to them. The UKs weren't formally subordinate to the Magister Militum. And that's kind of important um, just because there's a sort of ambiguity about how the structures of power work. Um, and in 545, the Magister Militum in Africa was an incompetent fool uh, called Aria Bindus, who is widely uh, disliked, not hated. Other people are hated. He's disliked within North Africa. So that's effectively the military structure. 
Um, on top of that, there are some other people it's worth identifying, not least the Bishop of Carthage, who has extraordinary cultural power, um, because Carthage is one of the oldest Christian dioceses in the Mediterranean world, certainly in the Western Mediterranean world, and there is a long heritage of extremely important Carthaginian bishops. Um, Reparatus has been in post for a long time. He was there at the time of the Byzantine conquest and was extremely enthusiastic about the Byzantine conquest, uh, leading the celebrations of 200 African bishops together uh, in a council in Carthage in 534, saying Justinian's the best, he's fantastic. Uh, and in recognition of this deference, he was formally made a metropolitan. So he became an archbishop, which wasn't actually the position before. So Reparatus has got a certain status within this world as well. Uh, and we've also got two other figures who we've already met, uh, Antalas, who probably comes from this sort of area in southern Byzantina, the area of the southern part of the Tunisian dorsal, uh, prob probably around Thelepte. Uh, and he's been loyal to the African state for quite a long time, but at this point um, is uh, kind of on and off in revolt. Uh, and another individual called Cusina, um, who's from the same sort of area, but is associated especially with Numidia by Procopius. So this is more or less the dramatis persona, kind of reduced dramatis persona, of where things stand a year before John Troglita turns up. Things start to go wrong in about 545 because the Dux Numidiae, so one of the two most important generals within North Africa, um, wants to become Magister Militum himself, or wants to have power himself within North Africa, whether to have further status within the empire or to set himself up as an independent tyrant isn't particularly clear. But he begins plotting secretly. He's in quite a strong position because the Dukes have got a traditional, uh, have traditional responsibility for kind of alliances, local alliances with neighboring barbarian groups. And he uses this, particularly his alliance with those two barbarians we've met, Antalas and Cusina, and basically says to them, if you attack Carthage, Eriabindus, who's stuck in Carthage, ideally will get his army together and come out and meet you in the field, and then he can accidentally die. And when he does that, I will take charge and I will give you each status uh, in my new sinister regime. This goes ahead according to plan until Cusina and Talas are more or less passed, parked outside Carthage. Eriabindus has been secretly sending messages to Cusina to try and get him on side and trying to get Guntherith to do the same. He doesn't realize, realize precisely what's gone wrong, but he is much too cowardly to actually leave the city and come out and fight against the Moors, whereupon Guntherith finds himself with a bit of a problem. He does things like leaving the gates of Carthage open in the hopes that the barbarians will come in and attack Eriabindus, but that doesn't work because they're a bit cautious of what looks like a, a trick. And then eventually he kind of the, the mask drops and he confesses that this is actually officially a coup uh, and takes power for himself. Eriabindus hides in a church um, seeking sanctuary uh, and Reparatus, the Bishop of Carthage, is sent uh, by Gunthrith to that church to basically reassure Eriabindus, say everything's going to be OK uh, and to draw him out. He does this. Eriabindus comes along, sheepishly says, you know, sorry for causing all the fuss. Um, they have a feast and Eriabindus is killed by Gunthrith. Uh, whereupon Guntheris basically takes charge, tries to marry Ariabindus's widow, uh, sets up uh, an Armenian uh, soldier called Artabanes as his right hand. Uh, he gives him the title of Magister Militum um, and basically uh, sets up his tyranny as it's described by Procopius. Uh, this doesn't last very long. It lasts for 36 days uh, before he is killed in turn um, at another feast. Um, and this is seen, sometimes seen as being a bit of a blip, but in fact is the last in a whole series of military mutinies and revolts that have beset North Africa since 536. The first of these revolts happened a couple of years after the first occupation. There's a major revolt that lasts for 10 years, uh, and then there's a series of these kind of mutinies and uprisings, partly because the, the army there are poorly paid, partly because the army in North Africa are poorly led, and partly because the distances are quite far. So very frequently they're just choosing to go it alone. Um, but Gunther's crew, uh, coup is the last um, of these uh, significant kind of moments. It's more important, I think, than it's frequently given credit for, and we can kind of tease out some of these significance um, in three different ways. Um, first, by recognising that according to the accounts that we have, the major figures, all of the major figures in the Byzantine administration in 546, so by the time John Troglita comes to Carthage six months later, these people are still in power. Almost all of them have been implicated in some ways within Gunther's conspiracy. Um, Artabanes, the Armenian leader who became Magister Militum, has actually been recalled and replaced by uh, John Troglita uh, and actually winds up uh, developing another rebellion a little bit later on in the year. Um, but his involvement has definitely kind of soured uh, 
uh, the view of the administration a little bit. Athanasius, the Praetorian prefect, dined with Gunzerith during his coup, um, seems to have continued in office throughout this period. Um, and the same is true of Reparatus, the Bishop of Carthage. He's directly implicated, obviously, in the betrayal of Aria Bindus. Uh, and in fact, Reparatus is subsequently tries uh, for treason as a result of this. Um, and that's partly connected to that theological debate that I talked about earlier. In fact, most of the leading citizens in Carthage who are still alive in the late summer of 546 seem to have got on relatively well with Guntherith. They might have been hiding it, but this is definitely not a particularly good look, especially as it's been viewed from Constantinople. Now, there are various different traditions about precisely what happened with Guntherith's death. Athanasius is given credit in some accounts, Artabanes is given credit in other accounts. Um, but the very uncertainty um, probably indicates that from Justinian's point of view, this is a genuine problem that needs to be solved. And from John's point of view, when he's rocking up to Carthage in 546, he can't necessarily trust the people who are in positions of power at the time. The military position is arguably even worse. Guntherith has come to power as Dux Humidii, and it seems extremely likely that most of his troops supported him because he would have been the person who would be able to pay them and ensure that they were fed. And that represented a substantial proportion of the African imperial, or the imperial presence in Africa. The only people who certainly resisted the coup um, were the troops of the Dux Byzacchini, Marcentius, who remained holed up in Byzacchina throughout this. Artabanes was sent to fight against him, but he resisted. So Marcentius and his troops remained loyal. As far as we know, everybody else was probably implicated in the coup. So probably about 60% of the Africa garrison had basically betrayed the emperor um, during this 36-day um, 36 coup. And as I said, this is the la latest in a series of mutinies that have beset North Africa throughout this period. Uh, and in fact, one of the striking things is in modern history, uh, modern historiography, the imperial occupation tends to be seen in very positive terms. This is one of Justinian's few successes. Contemporary chroniclers almost always, when they bother to refer to North Africa at all, they just refer to different mutinies and coups. That's the only time they really mention North Africa. This is just a region where rebellions happen, um, and that's it. Uh, and so in that way, uh, mutiny and revolt were defining feature, or a defining feature of early Byzantine African history. And the third implication is, uh, I think, the uh, the Moors. What actually happened uh, at the height of Guntherith's coup, um, he was initially supported by Antalas and Cusina, um, but Antalas seems to have turned against him halfway through the revolt itself. And there's a passage um, about this uh, on uh, 6b um, of the handout, which describes um, Gunther is basically refusing uh, some of the things that Antalas had originally been promised. As a result of this, Antalas joins Marcentius. He goes into revolt against Guntherith and tries to encourage a counter coup and explicitly declares his loyalty to Justinian. He sends a letter to Justinian basically saying, I'm on your side, I will always be loyal to you. And he indeed fights for the imperial cause um, with uh, Marcentius. Cusina always remains allied to Guntherith throughout the coup. Um, as a result of this, we have this position where loyalties cannot be at all clear at the time of John's landing. If we believe Charippus, he rocks up, Antalas is in arms against the empire, Cassina's always been an ally, um, we can trust Cassina will go and fight against Ant Antalas. In fact, the reverse would seem to have been true six months earlier. It was Antalas who was fighting on behalf of the empire, it was Cassina who was fighting on behalf of the usurper. So there is, this is an enormously confusing period, an enormously confused period. And it seems likely for people who lived through it, the inhabitants of Carthage who weren't themselves soldiers or administrators, who just got sick of all of this kind of upheaval, um, this was kind of more of the same. This is a chaotic period um, where there's nothing that the empire can do to really kind of deal with this ongoing shit show. So this is the kind of essential point that I want to make about how things faced John um, in the summer of 546. Um, everybody's loyalty was basically suspect at this point. Um, they lived through a huge amount of instability and military abuse in the area uh, and would have had, for the most part, fairly negative memories of at least the last decade or so. Um, and to an extent, as we'll see, this shows through within the poem itself. Um, and again, this is the last of a whole series of coups that have marked the history of the region uh, for about the last 10 or 15 years. Equally, I think we need to recognize um, 
the Moorish problems in this period, as I said, the, the Johannes itself is presented as a conflict between Romans with some Moorish allies and these Moorish barbarians who had been invading um, from the desert, effectively, or from the mountainous regions of the south. In fact, Moorish problems in the 530s and 540s were inseparable from the kind of internecine fighting, the struggles between dukes uh, and the usurpations and the mutinies. Um, that Guntherith kind of typified. Um, we've seen how Antalus and Cusina were moved into motion by <laughs> Guntherith's ambition. This has been happening for about 10 years um, as various different UKs are allied with neighbouring groups and try and kind of stake their own claim by manipulating or, or kind of manoeuvring these peoples around. This is not to say um, that the Moors were simply pawns in other people's games. And I think we have to recognise that individuals like Antalas and Cusina had their own ambitions and they certainly had their own agency. Uh, but nor do we need to regard them as being kind of implacably imposed to the imperial state who were driven by a kind of atavistic hatred of Carthage uh, or the kind of natural nomads hate, hatred for the sedentarists. Um, which is a simplification, a binary simplification that simply doesn't work in these cases, or even were driven by environmental change to move into the cultivated zone. None of this is true. Basically, what we have here is a really complicated series of interlocking social and political alliances um, that are magnified and set into motion by the individual political ambitions of Roman generals, um, as well as Moorish princes. And it's within this context, this hugely confusing political context that uh, John Troglita arrives. And this means that we can recast the Johannes in some senses or rethink what the Johannes is doing, given that it is kind of framing this as a conflict between Romans and Moors. Um, we can start to think of that as being a conscious decision. This isn't just a description of what's happening, but actually a way of recasting recent imperial history, an assertion of imperial control uh, and a statement that everything is now OK because we've won this victory um, over these brutal uh, outsiders. Uh, in some senses, that obviously feeds into Cameron's wider point. This is a way of asserting African loyalty and encouraging African loyalty um, within North Africa. Um, but I think the way in which this works changes a little bit when we see those circumstances. And we can start to think about why it is that Epic specifically is quite a useful vehicle or medium for doing that. Um, there are lots of ways of thinking about this. Uh, and over the course of the book, obviously, I explore these in different ways. But I just want to look very briefly to conclude at two kind of different approaches um, that relate firstly to the flashback that we see uh, in books three and four, which is to say that recapitulation of recent North African history in the voice of a Roman officer called Liberatus. Uh, and then think uh, briefly again uh, about the violence that we've already had a, had a look at, the ultra-violence um, within, uh, within the poem itself, especially the latter part of the poem. So the technical Latin name for a flashback is analepsis, and I realise that does sound like an extremely unpleasant medical complaint. Um, but this is a, uh, a sort of retrospective narrative, um, or a flashback is the, is the kind of easiest way of describing it. Uh, and the, the analepsis of books three and four within the, within the Johannes describes basically North African history from around about 500, the birth of Antalas, in fact, to 546, the outbreak of the war. But most of it is concentrated in the period from about 530, which is just before the fall of the Vandal Kingdom uh, and the Byzantine occupation, um, through to 546. Um, that means it is dealing with living memory, events that are very recent um, by the, uh, for most of the audience, most of the period uh, who are listening to it. Um, the audience for the flashback itself, the audience for this digression itself, are nominally John and his generals. So this is triggered by John saying, can anyone explain to me what's gone on? Um, and Liberatus, who's an African soldier, stepping forward and saying, yes, I can explain this to you. In fact, obviously, there is a secondary set of secondary audience here, which is the audience of the poem as a whole, um, as it's performed in 551 and elsewhere, which also included John, but also included the North Africans. So for the most part, this is retelling history or recasting history to an audience that is already familiar with the basic outline, which is just as well. Actually, It's extremely difficult to follow precisely how Liberatus, Liberatus describes what's going on without having Procopius next to us and various other sources to try and piece it all together. So it's not a straightforward narrative, but it is nevertheless a narrative and a recasting um, of these recent events. I think what's really important here is this allows Corypheus, the poet, to present the recent past, especially the unpleasant aspects of the recent past, the sufferings of the plague and all of these mutinies uh, and all of these military rebellions, 
in somebody else's voice other than his own. So it's not him saying all of this stuff is bad. It's this kind of lamenting figure saying all of this stuff is bad. Uh, and there is clear epic precedent for this. Uh, the analepsis itself is modelled on the famous analepsis at the start of the Aeneas, when Aeneas describes to Dido the sacking of Troy. Uh, this is the part of Latin literature that includes the famous description of the Trojan force. Um, and in fact, it's the second longest analepsis in Latin literature after that. Uh, and many of the aspects of the flashback are clearly modelled on the Virgilian precedent, including these kind of images of, of cities beset with flames and so on. Um, and this in itself, I think just kind of even thinking about when Caripus is writing and what he's writing about allows us to see different things within this historical narrative, effectively. Um, the way this is almost always described in modern studies of Caripus is that basically what he's doing here is describing a golden age of Africa that all went to pot when Antalus turned up and ruined things. This is described as a kind of golden, the golden age passages where he's describing this kind of perfect world of Africa. Um, and there's an example here, 7-1 uh, on the handouts. Everything was prosperous and there was a secure peace through the whole of Libya. In those days, Keres was fruitful, the vine breast with grapes and the colourful tree sparkled with jewelled olives. The farmer had begun to plant his new crops everywhere, laid out his yoked oxen and rejoicing ploughed his fields as he sang a peaceful song from the hillside. This is a bucolic image to say the least. Um, this is complicated, however, in two ways. This kind of image that there's this ideal world that's then destroyed by the barbarian turning up. First of all, the ideal world isn't actually that ideal. If we look at it in a bit more detail, another passage of the same uh, so-called celebration, golden age celebration, Africa did not mindlessly agree to war while you were vigilant, father. Its fields were thickened with blood, whitened with bones. The plough strikes heads torn from their shoulders and trunks are scattered over the grass by your sword. This is a piece that's won through blood and through combat and through fighting. So, and there is always a latent violence throughout his description of this idealised world. Equally significant, Antalus himself appears at the start of the analepsis, the start of the flashback, but after that is fairly, very quickly shoved to the side of the stage. He doesn't appear at all in the second half, which is largely concerned with precisely the kind of infighting that I've talked about, descriptions of uh, long uh, military mutinies um, and a brief account at the end of the Guntherist revolt. Um, as a result of this, as soon as we can see that this is actually writing quite, about quite a grim picture and focus on that rather than the positives, um, we can see that this is a really interesting counter narrative. At the least, what we have here is a poetic history written in 550 from the point of view of a North African thinking back on the past, on the recent past of his country before things improved as a result of um, some of these successes. Um, and that, even in itself, I think that represents a really uh, significant addition to our historical knowledge of this period. The other point that I want to make in finishing um, relates to that kind of ultraviolence and the, the images that, that I've talked about. And there's another example um, right at the end of the handout, which uh, which is a, one of um, uh, John's armour bearers doing a similar kind of set of moves. And it took me a long time to try and figure out precisely what was going on here, why it is that the poet devotes so much time to this. In part, it's probably because it's quite cool, he feels quite good at it, and it's relatively entertaining. And I think that is also the kind of historic reason, the moral reason why he includes this stuff as well, that we are clearly entering the world of the fantastical in these battle descriptions, um, just as we enter the world of the fantastical when we watch uh, John Wick um, or a John Woo film. Um, and I think that was a necessary contrast uh, to the grim social memories that are explored in the analepsis and other parts of the poem as a whole. Uh, and as a result, these episodes, which come in the second half of the poem, basically provide a kind of cleansing with blood, a wave of mutilation, um, to take away uh, some, of the, um, some of the grim memories that happened before. We emerge from this uh, series of battle sequences, uh, bloodied and unbowed. And I think that has a kind of important cathartic function um, within, this, within the poem in its wider social and political setting as a way of first making sense, first acknowledging and making sense of the suffering that everybody has collectively undergone over the course of the last 10 or 15 years, and then offering a way forward of basically saying we are victorious and we've earned this victory um, through these sequences where we can kind of, we can at, at this point at last kind of sit back um, and see this thing unfolding before us. Broadly then, I think we can conclude that Caribbean was certainly wrote in commemoration of the Byzantine victories in 548 to 540, uh, 546 to 548, and to celebrate 
imperial power in North Africa. But it wasn't quite as straightforward as a, as a sort of standard propagandistic reading of this poem might suggest. And in fact, I think always reading poetry as propaganda is problematic. Um, it's a difficult reading, even for something like Virgil's Aeneid, and it's certainly a problem here, where we have all of these really difficult elements within the epic that run counter to that reading. Um, in some senses, I think this is because epic is a much less easy genre to control than something like panegyric. And there are elements that always creep in with death and suffering and bloodshed, bloodshed and grief, which don't necessarily work very well within panegyric. But I think it's also because of the circumstances of his composition, precisely when Charippus was writing and what it was he was trying to do. Uh, an epic, in writing epic, he created some spaces for himself to explore through different narrative voices, for example, um, some of these really troubling things that everybody had gone through together. Ultimately, as I kind of worked through the poem, uh, I began to see it increasingly um, as a kind of transformation of this war-torn landscape uh, into a bold statement of victory that reminded me inevitably uh, of uh, George W. Bush standing on the deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln in 2003 uh, and boldly proclaiming uh, the mission was accomplished. We have basically won, blithely ignoring all of the kind of social political chaos um, that uh, that couldn't be won in this kind of form and that was going to resurface over the course of the years to come. Um, I think Charippus is doing something similar, but through his poem and through setting it in context, I think we can identify those troubles uh, and we can really sort of get to grips with the experience of war uh, on the ground in early Byzantine North Africa uh, and not just its mindless celebration. Thank you very much. Close this so we don't have George Bush looking down over us. <laughs> Great, uh, we have time for questions. If anyone in the room or... Terry. Uh, Andy, your uh, talk is subtitled. Yes. Why epic poetry doesn't always make the best propaganda. Um, you made quite a strong case for how it was able to recast um, this period of rebellion and mutiny effectively as the faults of outsiders and foreigners, the rulers, etc. So, in what sense do you think the poem fails or falls short? As propaganda, because that's what I take from your subtitle, why a poetry doesn't always make the best. That's a good question. Um, firstly, I think it is ultimately it is successful. It's hard to know precisely how successful it was within North Africa. We don't have very much evidence for its immediate reception, although Caripa subsequently got a job as a panegyrist in Constantinople, um, which suggests that it did something for him. Um, but I think the kind of, in, in scholarly terms, its success is illustrated by the fact that modern historical interpretations of Byzantine Africa basically follow a Caribbean line, which is to say, everything's okay, John Tret turns up, he fights against the Moors under Antalas, um, who are nomads from the desert, and he defeats them and everything's okay. So in that sense, my first point, yes, it is quite successful. My point is that it's, it's as much as anything else as a difficulty with propaganda. Um, in part, there are things that I perhaps, perhaps didn't draw out enough, that there are elements in epic that are always complicated, that you can get these kind of glamorous fighting scenes, but glamorous fighting scenes are quite a tricky thing in propaganda. Propaganda is best as a series of simple messages. That's where the notion comes from, of basically, right, these people are evil, these people are great, serve, obey. 5,000 lines of Latin is a complicated way of doing that, and if you're doing it with the inheritance of Virgil and Lucan, who wrote about civil war, when you're writing about conflict and suffering and death, that always, I think, necessarily kind of complicates the straightforwardness of that message, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think my charge isn't so much that the Johannes is bad propaganda, it's that we assume it's propaganda and therefore uninteresting as literature and as a historical source. And in fact, when we dig a bit more deeply, we can kind of get much more out of it. Uh, Andy, you made a flippant remark about John being a boring hero. Yeah. Why? <laughs> he 
Doesn't, that's a good question. He isn't really allowed very much emotion. The, so the, his model is Aeneas, Pius Aeneas, um, in the Aeneid, obviously. And Pius Aeneas in the Aeneid spends a lot of time praying, but also a lot of time, you know, being angry and killing people and having sex with Dido and stuff like that. Um, Don doesn't do any of that. I mean, he kills a lot of people. But he doesn't, he has a kind of, it's described by Cameron, and I certainly agree with her, as a kind of bland Christian piety. But he spends a lot of time kind of crying about stuff, but he can't really do anything wrong. He's a sort of, he's a little bit of a two-dimensional character. Um, and we see him in these fighting sequences. And other than that, he kind of rides around and makes some tactical decisions, but he doesn't have very much personality. And Talas has a much more interesting personality. It's a bit like in a Shakespearean comedy, the, the kind of romantic couple are always quite boring, and the villain is always much more interesting. And for the similar, same sort of reasons, that his job isn't to be interesting. Mark, yeah. You talked about um, the Johannes being a form in Carthage around the point. Just tell us a little bit about what we know that might have involved. It is really hard to say because we don't know that much about triumphal celebrations or victory celebrations at this time. Um, he makes enough references to the kind of the world of the celebrations going on around us, especially in the preface to the poem and in the opening two books, that it seems likely that he is kind of making, he is drawing the attention of his immediate audience to these, um, to these events. Uh, equally, there are various different points at which he mentions, for example, John's son, Peter, um, who doesn't really need to feature in the poem apart from as a kind of echo of, uh, of Aeneas' son, uh, Ascanius. But it has been argued that he's probably in the crowd and at various different points, he's just kind of making an acknowledgement. It seems like the most plausible explanation that I've seen um, is not that this happens at the triumph, which is probably, but in the kind of wider circumstances of triumphal victory over the course of the next couple of years. You have to write it amazingly fast to get it done in time for the triumph. Um, but in the kind of general circumstances of the next couple of years, and certainly the first couple of books are probably performed. The first couple of books are quite dense in literary allusions and with those kind of references. It seems to me likely, the, or more likely, that books three onwards are probably more likely to have been performed in isolation rather than performed as a kind of single moment. But it's, we just don't know that much about how this works by the 6th century. Well, what's the best guess as to what the, who would be at a, a Oh, the best guess would be the, um, the celebration of the, 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 the poem in the first couple of books, if that's what it was, would be performed for the great and the good of Carthage. Th those are the people he addresses right at the start of Vicari, so the kind of, um, the, uh, the rich people, the um, people who have, in, who would have, so Africans who would have relatively high status within the city, all of the members of the Byzantine civic administration, and that's quite a lot of people in bureaus at the time, we know that, and probably the higher, the military hierarchy as well. So people like John and his immediate entourage, it's probably why they're given. Um, so they would have been one of the audiences for this, one of the reasons why they're given their own kind of roles um, within the battle sequences as well. But it'd be a decent number of people, I should imagine, who'd be listening to this at the bottom. Put it back into 2003, it's like Halliburton executives and um, or, general staff. Or the deck of the US as Abraham Lincoln. I mean, I think that might be the kind of setting, especially a militarized setting like that, of basically saying this is this is where we all are together. Right. Thanks. Alex. And because there's actually a question there from David, no. but I can I, I do have one too, so you know, David was there first. <laughs> Uh, I take it other people may not be able to read that, so I'll read out. Fantastic talk, Andy. Thanks, David. Um, such Byzantine <laughs> politics, who knew? I find it interesting the way the poem creates bogeymen and righteously smites the Moorish Libyan peoples who live on the margins of the Byzantine territory. Was this the onset of a much more hardline relationship between Byzantine power and the Africans beyond the shrunken core territory? Yes and no, I think is the answer to that. That on the one hand, it definitely demonizes certain Moorish groups within the poem, uh, including uh, Antalas, as, uh, and as I said before, some groups um, from Tripolitania, groups that Nicole knows well. Um, but one of the really interesting things that I found when I was looking into Charippus's ethnography in particular was the degree to which he also talks about Cassina and the allied Moors using exactly the same language, or for the most part, the same language that he uses when talking about Antalas 
and the um, belligerent Moors, um, there are one or two terms. He uses a lot of adjectives to qualify this. So he refers to the bad Moors as being savage and fierce and ferocious and that kind of thing. And he doesn't use that kind of language for the loyal Moors. But he refers to them all as Maori or Marusii, um, and occasionally by the singular term Mazaks. Um, and he often talks about the confusion between different groups of Moors who are fighting on the battlefield. Um, and one of the things that I think he's making, the key, a key political point that I think he's making within this poem, which I didn't really have time to talk about uh, in the talk, is that his model of imperialism in Africa is not kind of the imposition of a Byzantine power over these subordinate groups, so much as a collective incorporation of these subordinate groups within Byzantine power itself. These are the necessary allies um, in order for the Commonwealth of uh, Roman power to work here. Um, and in order to do that, he talks a lot about the roles that these people have. He talks a lot about the inheritance of the Virgilian trope of um, subjecting the proud and uh, being merciful to the, um, to the uh, abject. Sorry, I've forgotten the line repeated about 50 times over the course of the book. Um, but that's an important kind of motif within his work. And he also talks about the, the polyglot and multicultural nature of the Byzantine army itself. You'll have noticed that lots of those names really don't sound very Roman. They come from all over the place. And he makes a point of describing how they come from all over the place. So there is this idea that this is a kind of international army under the banner of Rome coming together, including these Moors and potentially including these other Moors, but they just don't want to join in. Uh, and so they have to be expelled or they have to be defeated. So in some senses, I think it kind of ties into that idea of demonizing the other. But I think there is also the flip side of this, of the recognition of a variety of different kind of forms of experience. And I think that comes from the fact that Caripus himself is North African. We don't know precisely where from, but I think he's got this sense that this is a complicated ethnographic picture. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Alice, you said you had a question. Yes. A bit more about how the descriptions or how you think the descriptions of violence are an acknowledgement of suffering and you mentioned the word catharsis there which i thought you know everyone has to go through this harrowing thing so that you can come out sort of you know purified or better or, or, or whatever whereas the passages that you kind of read out seem very one-sided and quite frankly celebratory as yeah. you say like john wick there's no kind of catharsis there there's no mutual kind of there's no harrowing moments on a particular side, and it's really quite straightforward. So how does it... It's, yeah, uh, catharsis is probably the wrong way of putting it. In some senses, that, the, the kind of shared suffering happens in the analepsis. So when Liberatus talks about what everyone's gone through, he switches at one really crucial moment to the first person. So he's generally talking about the sufferings of the Africans, and then he talks about his own involvement in a mutiny and the suffering as a result of that, and, and thinks about the suffering that everyone's gone through. And I think that's the moment where there is this kind of shared identity between the narrator and the and the audiences and everyone is encouraged to kind of relive those moments that they themselves experience catharsis is the, perhaps the wrong way of putting the the stuff about the hyper violence i think the point of the hyper violence is is more a kind of emotional engagement or an adrenaline rush of kind of moving we kind of move into this different mode of writing and reception and seeing this as being oh now it's the really exciting bit and the heart starts racing rather than the tears start flowing um, and it's that that kind of helps purify. And I don't know if this, if this is necessarily what's going on, but that seems to me the best explanation for this. You never get sequences of violence like this in panegyrics. And although lots of people write about increased interest in sort of visceral realism in late antique writing and other genres, this is really kind of talked about as, as a classic example of this. This is unusually violent, even by the standards of the time. Yeah, okay. Um, I had a question on style. Um, obviously, you Thanks mentioned the Odyssey. Well, yes, that too. <laughs> obviously, you mentioned the Odyssey of having such a long panegyric slash epic at this point, 400 years since the last one. Yeah. Do you think that it could be a adoption of North African styles into the Roman model? I mean, I've been reading a lot recently about the idea of Python art and how it adopts local styles into a larger idea. So do you think the fact that this resurfaces at a later date could be an influence, especially since Corpus is not African himself, could be an adoption of styles? Yeah, I mean, to an ex yes, that's a good question. To an extent, North Africa is the last bastion of Latin, Latin learning, really, at this point, that shortly after the Byzantine occupation, quite a few North, African, North Africans get jobs in Constantinople teaching Latin because the schools survived throughout the Vandal period. Um, and 
Virgil would be extremely well known here more than I think any other part of the empire, certainly including Italy. Um, and Chiripus himself was probably a school teacher. One of the manuscripts identifies him as a, a grammaticus, so he would have been really familiar with this. I, I think as much as anything else, this is, it's partly, I think, an assertion of North African identity, North African Latin identity, cultural educated identity within a largely Greek speaking empire. One of the things that we can really hold up is our, the fact that we are the true inheritors of Virgil. And I think that might be one of the reasons why he kind of comes back to this and kind of brings it up again. Um, but it is very odd that nobody has really done this for centuries. And it's really unusual actually to write an epic about the very, very recent past. Most epics, as you know, are about the distant past. The Aeneid is centuries earlier. Uh, even Luke and Civil War is a century earlier, writing about actual living history in epic mode. There seem to have been one or two that are now lost to us, but there aren't any that survive. So that's quite bizarre. And you said that Chrippus went on to become a panegyricist for, for who, sorry? For Justinian's successor, Justin II, he wrote a, a poem in honour of his accession, basically, and probably wrote another panegyric in Constantinople at the same time. So that's in 566. So that suggests this did go down pretty well. That's the inference, yeah, certainly. That, uh, we, he may also have written a bunch of other poems. He seems to have written some other religious poems that haven't survived. And it's not impossible that he wrote tons of other stuff that haven't survived. It is the purest fluke that this has. But yeah, the, the kind of implication is that this was his way in. Is yeah. there any sense that he enjoyed John's patronage? Because in one of your quotes here, um, he actually compares John favourably with Aeneas and describes him as more valorous than uh, Aeneas, which is really quite a bold claim uh, to make. Uh, was there anything in it for him, making this sort of claim about John's outstanding valour? I mean, that's hyperbolic, obviously. Um, it's potentially, yeah, it's, it's hard to know how to kind of think about poetic patronage in classical antiquity compared with now. The, was this enough to get him dinners bought for the next 10 years? Probably. <laughs> so in that sense, he probably did OK about yeah. it. I mean, that's also a kind of further point of complication with the idea of panegyric. The talking about how fantastic John is, is OK. But you've got an emperor in Constantinople, Justinian, who is notoriously jealous of those kind of privileges. That as soon as anyone seems to be getting ideas above their station, he brings them back sharpish. Um, and so, and, and Justinian is actually praised as a kind of godlike figure in book one, but doesn't really feature very much at all in the poem. And I think one of the things that Charippus has to do within the poem is kind of walk that tightrope of saying, you're absolutely fantastic, John. You're not like God, because Justinian's almost godlike in his brilliance. You're really great. He's not that great. He's really great. Is that, is that kind of tightrope walking a little bit? John? We don't know, actually. Did he just fade from the scene? Yeah. Uh, he seems to have been recalled in, uh, in the early 550s because somebody else uh, has become a gifted militant in Africa. Um, but yeah, we don't know what happens after it. Yeah, sadly, we don't get a thing at the end of the talk where it goes the kind of future, like at the end of Animal House. And the only person who we know about is Cusina, who actually then does become a kind of favoured um, figure. Uh, for the next uh, couple of decades until he falls out of favour and there's another Moorish revolt uh, as a result of that. All right, uh, we are quarter past the hour, so I think it's definitely time we move this to the pub we'll to see some new things we can there, and we can certainly continue to ask Candy all about uh, the goings on of the sixth century there. And so let's, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.